welcome everybody to our uh, meeting and uh, it's pleasure for us to welcome uh, Dr. Ami Hogan Multan from uh, Saratoga Hospital and our friend Dr. Rashid Dawi and uh, uh, they will present or she will present a very nice presentation I think about hypertension treatment in chronic kidney disease and to Dr. Dawi if you can present our guest of, for today thank you so, so so before i start i would like to say salam to all which is peace on you all i would like to thank the speaker uh, dr amy hogan Morton, and all of you for being here today i am delighted to introduce my colleague dr amy hogan Morton, who will be presenting a talk about hypertension hypertension management and chronic kidney disease dr amy hogan Morton is a is a, a american board certified in internal medicine and board certified in nephrology and hypertension. Dr. Hogan is the co-chair of the Department of Medicine and the co-director of the nephrology division at Saratoga Hospital. Dr. Hogan is also the medical director of three outpatient dialysis center. And uh, she's also in charge of the plasma pheresis program at our institution. And without further ado, I welcome Dr. Amy Hogan to start the presentation. Thank you, Rashid. Welcome, everyone. Um, stay well, and if you have any questions at the end, I'm happy to take them. So the subject matter is hypertension in the chronic kidney population. The, um, the outline is a plan to go through definitions. It sounds pretty basic, but the reality is when you read stuff, the literature, it seems like there's so many different definitions that I'm not going to be able to address all at once, but at least I can, you know, kind of reference them as we're talking about it. Because when you read the literature, you have different kind of definitions of hypertension, but a, a little bit of pathology, um, partly because you're cardiologists, some are your nephrologists, but some cardiologists, and then, and then um, some target blood pressure goals, some treatment, the dialysis population, touch a little bit on the transplant population, and then whatever might be maybe coming, you know, novel therapies to think about. So chronic kidney disease itself is, you know, pretty common, um, not as common as the cardiac disease, but it's pretty common. So it affects about 10 to 15% of the world's population. And as we age and as our, you know, population is becoming, you know, more obese, more diabetic, um, you know, it's just increasing. So the definition is, as you see it, an estimated GFR less than 60 or proteinuria that's persistent more than three months, which is, these are not new or complex conversations. Most of us don't tend to see the patients when they're, you know, upper stage 3A kidney disease with a GFR of 58 or something, but the primary care docs do. But when they certainly get more compromised renal function, um, then they would be referred to, you know, renal docs but also they, you know, there's a group sharing of these patients between the cardiologists and the renal physicians. But so hypertension alone would be the number two cause on at least the US RDS data of what causes the dialysis, you know, the, the end stage renal population, but it's a begetting problem. Hypertension makes more renal failure, more renal failure drives up hypertension and makes you a more complicated patient to try to manage. We all see that. So just a tiny review, um, again, I wasn't sure if I was talking to cardiologists or renal docs, but the normal kidneys there, I put it in because I think it looks awesome. And then the, um, and then the glomeruli um, are pretty busy organs. There's components of the normal nephron. This is very schematic, but it's kind of interesting because it touches on this thing like down at the bottom here, the renal sympathetic nerves, um, you know, the efferent arterial, the vascular smooth muscles, the kidneys in general, are just a very vascular organ, but they're, you know, at a, at a, at a much tinier level compared to cardiologists, but they still get insulted by the same kind of events. Mechanism of renal damage. Um, I'm sorry, I have to keep moving it over because the, the, our faces are in the way of this, but mechanism of renal damage is again, a schema, but when we get tissue and pathology, we don't get just, oh, there's, um, 
you know, like a, an 80% block coronary or something like that, or you can put it, you could do a PCI or a stent or something. We get a lot of the data from the pathologists about what changes in the tubule interstitial area or the mesangial cells, a lot of things that happen at the level of the kidney that drive up progressive chronic kidney disease, proteinuria, but also drive up blood pressure as well. So, you know, the glomerulus, you know, this is normal. These are the insults, you know, blood pressure, but imagine a million of these little baby glomeruli uh, they really don't like high blood pressure. They tend to get insulted and over time damage. And that's what we kind of focus on trying to delay progression or having um, worsening disease. But when you look at the mechanisms over there on the left, you know, glomerular hypertension is one hyperfiltration, like, you know, the diabetics, the earliest lesion you see in a kidney related to a diabetic patient is not proteinuria or hypertension. You're going to just, if you bias in their glomeruli are going to be bigger and they're overworking. They'll tire out, but they're overworking. You know, proteinuria is a, is a measure we can, you know, assess, but all the rest of these things, you know, endothelial dysfunction, micro, you know, microabnuria is, is basically a marker of that, but those things you can't really see the mesangial hyperplasia unless, of course, you had a kidney biopsy, which in general, we don't tend to do for a routine hypertensive patient unless, of course, you know, there was something odd going on. We don't tend to get those biopsies so much. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just... So consequences of renal damage are as outlined on the side. The consequences, the GFR, you'll see the patients will come in your office, the hospital, the labs, the GFR will be going down, the proteinuria will be going up. Structurally, you know, this one, this tubular interstitial fibrosis is pretty important. The glomerulosclerosis, you'll see these glomeruli that should look normal, but then they've been just, you know, offended by these, the hypertensive response and they get obsolescent and they start to excrete protein. Some actual pathology slides would be, here's a normal glomerulus. As I said, they're just one cell thick. I mean, they don't, it's not hard to, you know, if you insult enough of them, they start to get protein and damage over time, but they should be very fine and, you know, filtering the, the tubules over here. But these are basically schemas of, you know, patho actual pathologic pictures of kidneys that are damaged where you can see these glomeruli just from whatever, usually it's, high, this one's a hypertensive picture, but, um, they over time just don't work. And then your GFR is going up and your um, protein's going up. Here's a schema. Um, there's a, this is a very common picture in the literature right now, but I'm going to reference it again. But the only point of putting this up isn't that you guys don't know this. It's just that it's, it's busy. It's like, there's not, there's not one real thing. It's just, you got to sort of try to tackle all the things. But when they talk about pathogenesis of hypertension in the chronic kidney disease population, um, you know, you get increased sympathetic tone. That's something you guys, you know, cardiology addresses pretty regularly. Um, increased salt sensitivity, meaning people will say, well, how much sodium should you eat or not? We're going to address it a little bit, but, you know, it, it's not good to have a high salt diet. It's very hard to get patients to change, however. Ocular regulation of the renal angiotensin system, you know, we'll address that a little bit. Endothelial dysfunctions in all of our literature and, you um, and the glomeruli are susceptible to that. Increased arterial stiffness, the same thing happens at the level of the glomeruli in the kidney, just like it does in the major cardiac vessels. Um, so these non-pharmacological therapies will go through a little bit to try to do anything you could mitigate that doesn't involve just drugs. Uh, wellness matters, it's just trying to get there is complicated um, and it often involves a dietitian. Um, but at the end result, you get the hypertension and chronic kidney disease population. You then become someone who's either listed as, okay, you're, you don't have protein or you have protein. And then you'll go down the alg algorithms, which we can talk about of, okay, if you had protein, you're a little bit different subset than not. And if you're a controlled blood pressure person versus not, you'll get add on therapies. Um, certainly over the side, when they say influenced by, you know, age or race or comorbidities, whether it's you know, your underlying diabetic or people are giving you chemotherapy or you're getting a cardiac cath, you know, in a PCI or they're doing CAT scans with dye or unfortunately if you're sick with the COVID or something else, um, those are kind of things that can affect anything you might have otherwise thought was a, um, a, a renal response can get altered by outside events here. So the terminology I'm putting here only because um, I think it's interesting, like you try, I don't know, I don't know why it has to seem complex, even though we talk about blood pressure, but it does seem to be. So clinic blood pressure would be, okay, I go to the doctor's office today and I got my blood pressure checked, <laughs> which to be honest with you, 
might have be what you guys have most of the time or not. I don't know. We're in upstate New York and we advocate for people to be able to purchase their own blood pressure cuffs, but not everyone can. We advocate for them to get an arm blood pressure monitor cuff, but they can't always. Sometimes their arm is too big and they would get a wrist cuff, which is pretty responsible, but the finger ones definitely aren't. But um, definitely the gold standard would be more, you know, a blood pressure cuff that could go on their arm um, if they, you know, could get one for home. And again, that's not all of our patients. Years ago, we used to have a, a subset of blood pressure cuffs in the office and we would loan them out and people would bring them back. But then over time, things got expensive and we don't have them. And now with the COVID, we can't even really send people to the local pharmacy to have the blood pressures checked where they used to because that, that's not allowed now either. And then with the people not being able to come to the offices all the time with the COVID, it's, it's gotten to be a little more complicated than you might think it should be. But um, so the measurements would be, okay, if you come to the doctor, I'm gonna go back to, if you come to the doctor's office and you have your blood pressure checked, there's a ton of data that says all of us, meaning the primary, the nephrologist, the cardiologist, as much as we want to do it correctly, it's, it's very time consuming and it's often not done correctly. It may be different with you guys, maybe, maybe you get people to come early and sit and rest and have it checked, but what is really supposed to happen is that a person is supposed to come to the physician's office or wherever they're getting their pressure checked and make sure they have an empty bladder and then make sure they're sitting in a straight back chair and their feet not crossed and then be supported and then have a blood pressure cuff on their arm and not be agitated by anybody, not be talking, not be having caffeine, not walking upstairs, not be filling out insurance information and then have a blood pressure cuff on their arm, on their skin, not on a shirt, and sit there for like six, seven minutes and get the pressure checked. That's what we try to teach them to do at home. And so in the offices, the measurement for the clinic blood pressure is not usually accurate and at best, you know, maybe not even helpful. So the way I use it is that we do it. We counsel people to say that our goal blood pressure would be in the renal world somewhere to 120 to 130. And if they can't, if they're not anywhere close to that, we would say, if you could purchase a cuff, that would be great. If you can't, there's some days that are lighter in the offices where you wouldn't be exposed to people. And then you'd have time to just sort of sit there and rest and try to get the pressure checked. That's a reasonable plan, but at least to teach the person what the blood pressure goal would be because we don't want them believing that the number that might be 155 or 45 or 48 in the office is good enough. Um, certainly the 160, 165, 70, we would have them come back and check them sooner. Um, another useful thing would be a 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure cuff, which has a lot of um, good data, although not most offices can't afford that either. Um, and then the whole, but it's becoming more common that, that people could try to get these ambulatory blood pressure cuffs and that provides a lot of good data. And then that home blood pressure monitoring, which I said, if they could get their own. But even so, even if they do it at home or in the office, those seven steps of trying to sit and, and responsibly check it, it's just, um, it's better done at home than not. And then I ask them to call the office in a couple of weeks um, with the data. And so I'll be honest with you, the lecture is good because I was received, researching a couple of things that I, well, probably a lot of things that I wasn't really sure about, but I would tell people, they would say, well, how often do you need the blood pressure checked at home to check, to know? And I would say, well, it's not supposed to consume your life and I don't want you medicalized at home, but if you could check it like a smattering of a Monday morning or a Tuesday at noon or a Wednesday at night and a Friday, you know, I mean, some kind of ladder kind of pathway of what it is then that's sort of useful. But really when I was drilling down on it, it said that if you could actually check at 2 a.m. and 2 p.m. every day for seven days, that would give a good idea because then you would you would catch those nocturnal non-differ people um, and know what their day are you know, for the week and have an idea that might mimic what an ambulatory blood pressure cuff would do, which most people don't have. So I thought that was interesting. If you had a compliant patient that really wanted to know, if they checked at 2 a.m. and 2 p.m., but but I don't I don't have anybody that really would do that. So that's where we're at here. All right. So under definitions, there's a lot of them. I, I mean, I'll just talk about them. But it's it's we can only really when we say blood pressure, we kind of meet what's in front of us, whether it's a dialysis center or in the office or someone calls it from the home data. But 
All right, so definitions control would be, okay, as much as there's a myriad of data about what your actual number should be, if you're controlled, that's awesome. You, you know, you've got controlled blood pressures. Um, these dippers, these non-dippers, like these, these patients, especially the dialysis patients at night, they don't tend to dip down. And so you ought to get a lower blood pressure at night when you're sleeping, but they don't tend to physiologically do that. So that's, you know, one of the language. The white coat hypertension person is, you know, probably a benign person, statistically a benign patient, but really it, it makes me very uncomfortable when someone comes in and they're 165 on the pressure or 170 and they say, oh, I'm fine at home. I, I kind of say, well, we have to prove it. You know what I mean? You just got to um, try to do out of office blood pressures if able. Um, the sustained hypertension person is, you know, they just don't come down for, you know, until you actually do an intervention. Um, the mass hypertension would be the person, of course, where you they're fine in the office. And then of course they're not at home. And the only way you know that is either the 24 hour ambulatory cuff, which most of us don't have or the home blood pressure monitoring, which would be helpful. And then the nocturnal systolic um, hypertension, they're like fine all day and then not. But um, so it's, it's a lot of terminology. And I only say that because some of these, when you read some of these things, some address some, some don't address others, but really um, at the end of the day, most of us can just deal with what we've got in the office. Um, all right, so blood pressure threshold on this ambulatory blood pressure cuff, even if you knew exactly what blood pressure they're talking about and what measurement got done, then of those, they have different criteria. So if you had an ambulatory blood pressure cuff, your daytime mean systolic pressure should not be above 135 over 85 in general. The 24 hour blood pressure monitoring for the 24 hour average shouldn't be much above 130 over 80. And nighttime is considered much above 120 over 70 because we ought to relax and go to sleep. And if you're not on call, you probably have a lower blood pressure at night. But um, so that's kind of that. Those are the details in reading some of the stuff. And it's, you know, we're all just doing what we can do. But it, but it is interesting what some of the hypertension specialists um, really do look at. All right. So um, I don't know why I, I keep moving this over because I can't see it because of our face. Can you guys see the whole slide? Yeah, I mean, we can, yes we no? can see it. Yeah, we can yeah, see it. Gets, it. it gets cut off. Yeah. All right. So on the 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure cuff in the chronic kidney population, this was from Jason recently. It's the Crick trial data. Um, basically, some of the data came out was interesting is that, and I'm not trying to go over all the data. I'm just trying to bring out the fact that you got to kind of look at which blood pressure time they're talking about and which person they're talking about. So like a higher mean 24 hour systolic blood pressure was associated with a higher, you know, cardiovascular outcome um, and um, in mortality. The nighttime systolic blood pressure was associated with more, a little bit with the kidney outcomes, the reverse dipper profile, they had worse, you know, kidney outcomes. The non-dipper, they had more strokes, like the, you know, when you guys get called at 6 a.m. and people are worried about AFib and a stroke or something, if their pressures are higher, um, you, you know, it, it could be an embolic stroke, could be a hypertensive stroke. But the blood pressure, the non-dipper has a risk of CVA and PAD compared to the, um, the dipper profile is what they said. All right, so proteinuria, again, for all the nephrologists, this is basic. For the cardiologists, it's, I'm sure, basic too, but um, it does matter because it's considered an important marker of renal damage, primarily because there's a million glomeruli and they're basically, you know, they all have endothelial cells. Um, independently associated um, with chronic kidney disease progression and cardiovascular disease, um, you know, albumin to creatinine ratio over three milligram per millimole. These are, this is off just data, but really that would be a lot, that'd be a very small amount of protein, but this is what they're reporting. Protein creatinine ratio over 15 milligram per millimole. And the way I use this is sure we quantify protein. Yes, we address, you know, the, um, the RAS blockade to try to reduce it. But, but in general, what I kind of always think is, okay, if you're, I try to teach the person, okay, if you're someone with not a perfect heart or not a great kidney or, you know, a history of stroke, that's one thing. But if you're a patient with those things and you're excreting protein, you have to sort of believe that you're, you know, probably it really matters to get that blood pressure controlled and try to micromanage even more. And they, and they believe that it's just that trying to get there sometimes involves conversations of not smoking or, you know, stuff like that. So it's, it's just a conversation. 
All right, so as far as protein area, blood pressure reduction reduces protein area, slows GFR decline, and reduces cardiovascular risk. The RASA blockade appears to offer blood pressure independent reduction in protein. So even if there are some people in our office that come, you know, an every nephrologist in the world who might have some protein, but their blood pressure is fine, and, and it's fine just to watch it. But then when it seems like it's accelerating or it's a lot, we might say, you know, I know you don't have a high blood pressure and I don't want you passing out, but a little bit of an ACE would probably go a long way, even if it's not every day to try to reduce protein um, to help you long-term. And they usually do it and like lisinopril is pretty cheap. So it's usually fine. Um, all right, so the, this, I'm gonna, two slides down, I'm gonna get to why this yeah. seems a little convoluted. There's goals of blood pressure reduction and blood pressure targets. Um, the guidelines governing, so cardiologists have a lot of trials, <laughs> kidneys sort of, but kidney, you know, not as many. So the guidelines governing the management of chronic kidney disease are relatively few. You know, the MDRD trial was 94, AST trial was 2002, the RAIN was 2005, ACCORD was 2010, SPRINT was 2015, which got a lot of press, but it was very difficult for everybody to interpret. Um, the CRIC trial they put out this year um, American Cardiology, um, the American Cardiology Association 2017 said hypertension and chronic kidney disease target, they want it less than 130 over 80. Everybody put out something different that they wanted. Um, you know, the UK renal, they said less than 140 over 90 if your protein is less than a gram, so it mattered to know what you're doing. The European peeps in 2018 said go less than 140 regardless of protein. So it's good that we're all thinking about it, but it really was na no major consensus. And I don't know that it's going to be in my lifetime. I'll be perfectly honest with you. So um, chronic kidney disease, diabetes and hypertension targets, you know, again, like American Diabetes Association, you know, it depended, they have the, all these algorithms, whether you're protein or you don't and the goals they want it, which is fine. And it's good to be attentive, but it gets a little convoluted. Um, and then to you guys, the American, you know, cardiology and AHA, um, you know, you would have about the same thing, but you made it easier on yourself because you just said it's one number, less than 130 over 80. I thought this was a really interesting study, or not study, but a, a slide here that came out of paper back years ago. But, but this is why I think it's interesting. It says use of baseline conditions as exclusion criteria in large cardiovascular trials. So to all the cardiologists, you guys have so many trials and so many patients, but it became a little difficult to know what to do with our peeps, the um, you know chronic kidney disease patients or the proteinuric patients because Honestly, they got largely excluded from the trials because they they probably would have, I don't know, they would have skewed it or they were complex or something, but they weren't really in the trials early on. So, you know, the hypertensive peeps, peoples were, the diabetic, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that's part of the problem why it's taken so long to figure out exactly where we are. And again, I'm not going to be able to tell you that there's a final answer. There's just guidelines and then I'm sure it will keep changing and it will probably keep changing for a very long, long time. So, um, so this is just, a, again, a, like a, a pretty good slide on some of these trials I'm talking about. And when you look at the green ones, um, they kind of focus a little bit more on kidney, which was a while ago. And then when you look at the red ones, they were a little more cardiovascular protection, which was, you know, major cardiac trials with a cord and the sprint and stuff like that. So um, it's just, it seems like everything takes so long and I, I, you know, you got to have people involved. You got to have the right people doing the trials and it's all very expensive as probably, but then if, if the renal people and the proteinuric people aren't invited to the trials, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure how we're really going to get all those answers. Anyhow, this was also recent. This was the, um, some of the quick stuff. So I'm trying to move the slides so we can see it better, but it had a, a representation of the 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure in the chronic kidney disease population. Um, they followed these patients for 6.7 years. And if you look down the bottom, um, you know, the composite cardiovascular outcomes, the renal outcomes and all-cause mortality. Um, and then if you look, so the dark blue box is the controlled blood pressure person. So that's great for both cardiac and renal and all-cause mortality. The, the maroon one is, okay, white coat um, hypertension and those people you know, did well if you were just looking at straight cardiovascular outcomes. In the renal world, it was a little bit worse. 
Um, all cause mortality really wasn't though on the white coat hypertension. On the mass hypertension person in the cardiac world, it was a little bit worse, but in the renal, it was definitely worse. And then in the sustained hypertension person, clearly in the cardiac world, there was more cardiac outcome problems than, you know, than the renal, but still these mass hypertension issue um, is kind of important in the renal division. And, um, and, and however you, you say it all, you know, higher blood pressure, there was all cause mortality that was higher. Oh, I'm sorry. So then achieving blood pressure targets. Um, I'm bringing up the strength only because it was a big trial, but it was a complicated trial. But anyway, so sprint demonstrated greater than 50% of those in intensive treatment groups failed to achieve target systolic blood pressure. And the reason I bring that up is because um, it is really hard. Like patients, I had a patient this morning that said, You're, you want me to be on another blood pressure pill? I'm already taken two. And I guess the issue is that I tend to say, well, you know, it's better for you to be a goal, you know, you know, other modifiable things like, you know, you know, lower salt diet, losing weight would be great. But in the meantime, I don't want your risk for stroke or progressive kidney disease or a cardiac event. So yeah, you might need another pill. And the average amount of pills to control blood pressure is recorded at times as being 3.3 pills. Um, so the CKD population is even more challenging to try to achieve blood pressure goal. Um, and here's the kind of, you know, these, these hypertension meetings pretty much will say, despite non-pharmacological interventions and multiple pharmacological antihypertensive meds, the CKD patient fails to reach target blood pressure, which over the years, one of the words that's been thrown around has been, has been lack of inertia, meaning I think at times that they're, you know, I know it's multifactorial that the patient might not be able to afford the drugs or they might not be able to get to goal or they might not be able to quit smoking or they might not have enough money for vegetables and stuff um or they're living with someone that's doing the cooking and they won't get rid of sodium i mean it goes on and on or they can't ambulate you know they can't ambulate and they can't lose weight um so then their pressures are higher and so we advocate chair exercises and other creative ideas but at the end of the day sometimes it could be that we as physicians or providers just sort of settle because it's like complicated to try to get the person at the goal um, because it is a lot of pills sometimes. I put this in here only because it was, um, well, relevant for nephrology. So that was one thing, but, um, and this again, going back several years here, but it said, um, Sprint reaffirms the need for blood pressure control, but it is not a sufficient standalone guide for nephrologists treating the chronic kidney disease in the community, um, meaning we have to do a lot of other things to try to help the renal progression. But um, Chertow had said, you know, determining the optimal blood pressure targets for all patients with chronic kidney disease will likely take one or two more decades of effort, um, and it's a marathon, not a sprint. And that's, you know, that's because I think it's so multifactorial. And yeah, renal people were often excluded from the trial. So it's just, it's fine. It's just sort of makes you understand a little bit more why as much as we might know what goals we want people to be at, we don't really always get there for a host of reasons. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not gonna talk about that, I don't think. Um, I, I think the major issue is just controlling the blood pressure you know, for all cause mortality, controlling it is better than not. And again, that comes back to those words I've heard for 20 years, which are, you know, try to keep at it. And it just seems to take a lot of time to get there. I put the AS trial in there. It's, it's, it's not new, but it was relevant to the kidney population. And um, again, you know, different populations might need different meds, but the AS trial was important for renal. All right, so non-pharmacological treatment. I put a few things here. I could have probably put a lot more, but um, you know, we try to restrict sodium. I don't know how you guys have success with that or not, but um, you know, the American diet is around like I think on average that's reported maybe five grams of sodium a day. We do it did say in this some of the papers I was reading to say less than three grams of salt per day, but really most days we say less than two if we could get the person to agree to it. And we send them to dietitians. We have a very active, um, it's like a, re a renal educational program that gets you access to nutritionists to try to restrict your sodium and learn more about the food and um, you know what's in the food because less than two grams would probably be better. Um, 
there is some data that says non-pharmacological interventions, you might actually get to reduce the blood pressure by as much as 10 millimeters of mercury, but that's very, if someone changes a lot and had a lot to change, that would, most of the data I've seen over the years have been more like maybe six millimeters we should feel pretty good about if we got them to change that much with non-pharmacological. Um, and of course, unfortunately, as the glomerular filtration declines, um, the blood pressure sensitivity to salt increases and the patient will come in and say, I'm swollen. Don't you know, don't you know, doc, isn't it the amlodipine or something? And it could be, but it could just be that they're also, you know, eating too much sodium that they're not even recognizing. And then they're getting more edema and they're becoming more um, diuretic. Um, you know, they're, you know, they're needing diuretics to try to control the problem. But, but the dietitian definitely are helpful. There's a lot of data also about weight loss, which I have seen over the years actually making a difference. Again, I'm not sure um, what your guys average BMI is, but um, we tend to be heavy here. And um, people with chronic kidney disease and proteinuria weight loss, you know, 4% can reduce protein, it also can reduce blood pressure. And and it's possible. I mean, for people who will say they can't ambulate, there are these people that we advise, you know, chair exercises and stuff like that. Um, and if they are able to lose weight, they really do over the years um, seem to have better blood pressure control and improved GFR. Um, so I, I, you know, on the chronic kidney disease risk for progression, you know, obesity falls in there. Um, it's just, it would be helpful if we could all get thinner, clearly. Anyway, this, this slide is kind of cute. It said, you know, salt reduction is helpful. Um, small changes in blood pressure have large effects on cardiac, cardiac risk. So on the, um, you can just see here. So the major cardiovascular disease, it doesn't really matter which one you're trying to prevent <laughs> and reduction in systolic blood pressure. Um, but if people could reduce sodium intake, you know, it's good for the heart, it's good for the kidneys. All right, so pharmacological treatment, uh, there's a host of things. I'll just, I mean, you guys know most all these drugs, but um, I'll go through them in a little bit of detail that's, you know, kind of relevant to renal here. So not new, but you guys all know the renin angiotensin cascade slides over the years, um, you know, 9% incident of cough with an ACE. So then the people sometimes go on an angiotensin receptor blocker. It used to be that, okay, you could do an ACE and an ARB to reduce protein. That's become out of significant disfavor. You certainly could do an ACE or an ARB with um, a mineralocorticoid med as long as you were watching the potassium, but we certainly wouldn't start with that because you'd be worried. Um, but that cough is, you know, interesting. And, and then, and the cost of the angiotensin block, receptor blockers in the United States have gotten to be reasonable. Um, again, a scheme, a role of ANG2 in the chronic kidney disease patient. Um, you know, nephron loss is what we're trying to prevent. Progressive kidney disease is what we're trying to prevent um, for a host of reasons. So the ACE and the ARBs on the kidney, not together, but the slide was, you know, it has both on there, but we have, you know, it is out of disfavor to use both at the same time. but. The afferent arterial, um, you know, is, um, you know, bringing your blood flow in the glomerulus. The ANG2 inhibits the, you know, efferent, um, you know, constriction. So um, the, the teaching would be, okay, you expect that you might get a rise in your creatinine. Um, you don't want a doubling, but you might expect a rise. So you're, you're advised to maybe check a BMP one to two weeks after starting every dose adjustments. Um, it's probably a good idea, although in the person who's really well hydrated um, and has like a CKD three, you know, upper three B or something like that, they aren't as worrisome. If you're a stage four patient or stage five chronic kidney disease patient, absolutely check it to make sure you don't induce hyperkalemia. And I would start even before escalating doses to explain what's in a high potassium diet and try not to eat it, you know, so you don't get into troubles with the potassium. As far as a 30% rise in creatinine is considered okay. Um, if you doubled, you get more worried. If you got AKI with a renal angiotensin blockade, you have to strongly consider renal artery stenosis, um, which happens. You know, I, I didn't address renal artery stenosis on this talk, primarily because it's increasingly uncommon that we would actually do an intervention on a renal artery. It's a, it, it, can, it can be necessary, and we work closely with the vascular surgeons about those subjects, but 
it's just not nearly as common as it used to be. Um, and all the major trials, they didn't really have, um, you know, any major indications unless you got progressive stenosis and uncontrolled hypertension and worsening renal function. So, so when I put people on ACE and ARBs, well, first of all, they usually show up on them. So we might do dose escalation, but if they're not on them, then we would at least teach them to stay hydrated, follow a lower potassium diet, and we would recheck the labs. And if they, and I, and I'll say to them, I understand that we're the, I'm the kidney doc, but I know I don't want your kidneys to fail, but in the long run, you're going to get more health and wellness and mileage out of your kidney function if your creatinine does go up a little bit because it means it's not having to work quite so hard to live as long as you're living. Um, all right, so on to volume mediated blood pressure and chronic kidney disease. Um, at the level of the glomeruli and you know kidney, there's in the tubules, there's a pressure and aterosis. Um, diuretics tend to be necessary in a person to control blood pressure in a chronic kidney disease patient. Again, maybe not like CKD3, upper 3A, but stage 3B and lower usually, yes. Um, so just going back to this, the, so we, we do advocate them, again, in the United States, you know, we can talk about the loops, but the um, thiazides that tend to get used are the hydrochlorothiazide, although you know, chlorothaliodone became more in favor a decade ago. But prior to that, we weren't really writing chlorothaliodone a whole lot. I don't know what you guys use, um, but the um, it is helpful. And so now we have some ARBs like a Darby um, already having chlorothaliodone attached as a double, um, double medicine therapy. But uh, most of the drugs, even now, even though we know that chlorothaliodone has a longer half-life, most of the drugs that are combination are still with HCTZ. All right, so um, the thing about chlorothaladone, why I put this up there, is that chlorothaladone has more, it's able to work longer 24 hours. So there is some data about using it because you might get a more nocturnal effect and getting back to that non-dipping of the kidney patient, it might actually get you more efficacy if they were on chlorothaladone um, to help to the overnight blood pressure control. All right, loop diuretics, you know, unfortunately you need escalating doses the worse your renal function gets, as you guys, the cardiologists would know, kidney doctors would know, but, um, you know, higher doses are needed in a, you know, you know, if you've got a, a good GFR, you know, you know, pretend your GFR is 50, you might need a 20 milligrams of Lasix might make you pee for two days, I don't know, but the, but when you're down in 18 and 19 and 20 and, you know, maybe 23, 24 GFR, you need a lot more diuretics to do the same effect. Um, so, and of course, if you're hypoalbuminemic, either from, you know, malnourished patient, sick, ICU, you know, septic, or, you know, a nephrotic patient, um, it, it's bound to albumin and you, you get, you know, less efficacy when you have less albumin. So, um, you have to find the right dose and see what you, you know, your response to it with the patient. Again, checking weights at home are useful. Again, we advise people to try to have a weight, a scale at home, but it, it's not even feasible for all of our patients. So um, I'm just having trouble. Like our slides are getting cut off here. But so this one is a comparison of furosemide, Bumex, and torosemide, um, IV and PO doses. And I hope you guys can see it, but basically it's a good little tool about comparing the efficacies of them. Um, differences. So we didn't, you know, again, Years ago, it was always, it was Bumax, it was Lasix, furosemide, then torosemide came on, and we absolutely use torosemide. We believe that torosemide has, you know, more consistent bioavailability and maybe even absorption, um, but a longer half-life. So if we're able, we tend to use more torosemide. Um, we use IV Lasix, we can use IV Bumax if needed, um, but it's a little bit regional in this country which di loop diuretic people are using, but we do try to use quite a bit of torosemide available. Although, like even at the renal center, we have Lasix on formulary and not torosemide. So it just depends where you are. Um, um, so oral, the thing I've always thought was interesting on all these congestive heart failure patients, um, oral furosemide has limited availability, meaning, you know, I always tell people, well, if you're puffy outside, you're puffy inside. So if you're, if you're swollen outside and you gain 15 pounds and you're having trouble breathing, you need to imagine that your gut is also internally um, 
thicker. And so getting a pill across that membrane to get absorbed into your bloodstream is just harder to do is why you might need IV LASIX at the, you know, a heart failure clinic or at the infusion center, or if you had to get hospitalized. Um, so, but from a kidney perspective, if you can get these drugs to work, there's really no strong evidence of one loop over the other. You just got to know what you're working with um, to try to get the response you're looking for. Um, so the not, I put the slide in here at this point because the non-dipping in the chronic kidney population, again, it comes back a little bit that chlorothaladone might be helpful for us because it um, might work more not, you know, all night long compared to hydrochlorothiazide. And um, the thing about the loop, the thing about the loops are that you could use them to any GFR. The thing about the thiazides, the data is a little bit variable, but they don't have a lot of efficacy to get rid of much volume much above, I mean, usually we say 25 on your GFR, maybe 22, but really there's a lot of data that says 30. So once you're in that stage four kidney population, as much as you might've relied on chlorothaladone or hydrochlorothiazide all the other years, it becomes a time to probably switch over. It would be tough to use both together because you probably would get significant electrolyte abnormalities in your trace in hyponatremia or hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia. Um, here's a, you know, an algorithm for a proteinuric chronic kidney disease patient with high blood pressure. You know, you'd first prescribe an ACE or an ARB. Again, not both. You might start with the diuretic. It just, I'm telling you this because it depends on the person's blood pressure and who's in front of you. It's not like saying, oh, you've got a cardiac stent and you've got to be on, you know, um, Plavix for a year. It's not, it's not, it's dogmatic. You've got to deal with what's in front of you. So, um, you try to maximize the ACE or the ARB, you check the BMP, um, when your thiazides become ineffective, like when your GFR is, you know, I'd say 25, maybe it's 30, but you might have to change to a loop. You might have to consider a calcium channel blocker. There was some data over the years about verapamil or the non-dihydropyridines reducing protein more than the dihydropyridines, but it's a little bit weak. But we do, so the thing I run into trouble when we talked about that over the years was the verapamil and the deltaiz, and the problem is, they affect your heart rate. So it's it's nice that theoretically they might reduce protein, but it does limit your ability when the person gets an MI and everybody wants them on a beta blocker. Um, you then have to you know switch off anyway. So um, you know, a GFR over 45, a potassium less than four and a half. Um, you might want to consider a spironolactone, a plerinone if you can afford it. Um, you know. Here's when they, when they wrote consider adding an ad resin to follow. I didn't put it in this um, article or this this um, presentation, but there are resins that are out there that are very useful. Valtessa and Localma are the brand names. So Valtessa is a um, calcium potassium ion exchanger at the level of the gut to excrete out potassium to help you be able to use the drugs of choice more freely that we're causing hyperkalemia. So if you got a high potassium and you're a nephrotic cardiomyopathy patient and you're, you know, you're getting hyperkalemia, it becomes a conversation in the office, you know, do I have to come off RAS blockade um, or a little bit of spironolactone or can I stay on it with, it's usually a cardiac renal group conversation, but, or can I stay on it and educate you with the nutritionist and then maybe go on like Valtessa, which would probably, um, reduce the potassium and allow you to stay on the drugs, which is fine, but it sounds, it gets into a lot of polypharmacy. It gets into a lot of time explaining to the drug. I do think it works um, and I do do it, but it it's difficult sometimes for me to even get the meds covered by the insurance consistently. Um, KX late came out of favor because there's this conceived risk, uh, there's, there's perceived risk of ischemic bowel, which could happen um, but I've been fortunate enough not to see it, but that's why we can't just use basic KX late consistently, which we used to do. We used to say, okay, take 15 grams once or twice a week and, you know, we need a low potassium diet and I hope you can, you know, we want them to stay on their cardiac drugs or renal drugs. Um, anyway, the people that, and so this other one, this Localma one exchanges out, it's not indicated for acute reduction of hyperkalemia, but it is more for chronic although we sometimes do use it in the hospital, but it's designed to exchange the sodium for potassium. Um, and it does, it does work also. It's just, it ends up being money in polypharmacy for these patients. Um, 
But I would, if I had a, a cardiac, a cardiomyopathy and proteinuria, I'd probably want to be on the ACE and aldactone um, or ARB and aldactone and then probably take it just to stay on the drugs, most likely. Um, but so all others, you know, there's, you know, if you're not controlled, we can add on other things like maybe move the um, RAS blockade tonight, maybe put an alpha or beta blockade, which is fine. It's just that you got to know what the other drugs the patient has. I will tell you on the alpha blockade, it's, um, it's like, it's down there, maybe fifth, I don't know, maybe fifth, sixth, but as far as what drugs to add on, but it's very important to start low and go up because of the or risk of orthostasis. All right, so I put this slide in there because I, I'm seeing more of this kind of thing, like when and who to screen for primary aldosteronism. Um, I think sometimes maybe I should screen more, but... Um, Anyway, severe resistant hypertensive, like blood pressure over 150, over 100 um, consistently, or over 140, over 90 on three meds, or less, you're still like 140, over 90 on four plus meds, or the hypertensive patient with spontaneous or diuretic induced hypokalemia, meaning you might have had a hypertension and then you put them on just say 25 or chlorothaladone or something, but if they get significant drop of, of potassium, you're going to have to at least think about this as being a possibility. People get lots of CAT scans for different things, and sometimes you just pick up adrenal masses. That's a possibility. Um, the hypertensive sleep apnea person, the hypertensive, the family history matters on a lot of this because they might say, oh yeah, several of my siblings or my mom or somebody had, you know, this tumor or um, they've got other problems. And then um, or the family history of really early onset strokes or hypertension. Some of that applies also to those antiphospholipid antibody families, but that's kind of what you want to know. All right, so I'm going to move on to a population that is complex and we see every day and it's extremely difficult to manage. That, that, that what we talked about early up there was in my opinion, way easier than the poor dialysis and the dialysis patients because they have such vacillations in the blood pressure. So it becomes a little bit difficult, like the patients show up to dialysis and if they take all of their pills, then they often don't have a blood pressure to be effectively dialyzed. If they hold some of them, which ones to hold? And that's a little bit challenging. Um, and certainly if we're sitting as nephrologists with these patients weekly um, and saying we might have to get rid of a drug, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't get rid of um, blocking drugs like, you know, alpha or beta block, or, or mostly beta blockers, or like a non dihydropyridine without calling a cardiologist to say, did you guys have this person on it for a particular reason, like an SVT or an MI or something that I can't tell from the charts or what's in front of us. So it does involve a communication with everybody. So the, the dialysis patients um, you know, should we use pre blood pressure or post blood pressure to diagnose hypertension? Or should we be using some other parameter like um, pre and post, you know, dialysis blood pressures um, are very variable, the technique is poor, like I, we like to be very responsible, but I will tell you that patients come into the renal center and get their blood pressures often checked even when they have um, not on their bare arm. Like it is common that in the renal center, the patients will say, cause they have to have their blood pressures checked frequently during their treatment. And the room might be very cold. We like the, we like the temperature lower because then they won't drop their blood pressure as much, but um, they often get their blood pressure checked even with their, you know, I'm not, I hope not coat sleeve, but maybe their shirt sleeve, which isn't really standard of care, but that is what happens in the world. Um, so when they say technique is poor, it's not that people aren't trying, it's just that it's, it's difficult to do all of this. So um, pre and post dialysis blood pressures agree poorly with the intradialytic um, blood pressures. We know that. I'm not certain that we have a great answer to all this, but this is the chart that I think is important relevant to the cardiology population and the and nephrologist. So, you know, USRDS puts out data all the time, but the cause of death in a renal patient is cardiac. You know, I mean, it's, you know, acute, you know, MIs, it's cardiac arrhythmias, it's heart failure. Absolutely, they do get infected when they have lines. Absolutely. And absolutely, they get malignancies, but there's no doubt about it. they are a cardiac renal population that needs to be attended and protected. So diagnosing hypertension in um, the ESRD patient, there was a, some data that said, um, you know, a midweek 
Median intradilated blood pressure of over 140 or over 90 had better sensitivity for establishing their in between, you know, blood pressure than a post blood pressure. And then the home blood pressure rates cor correlate morally more closely with the ambulatory blood pressure. Um, so, you know, it's advised to consider measuring twice um, daily after a midweek dialysis for four days and see what the blood pressures are. And again, we do encourage people to have their own blood pressure cuffs and do this, but as much as we do talk like this all the time, it doesn't really happen. And as much as you will stand there and say, bring them back, I'll, I'll look at them and I'll try to help change it. They don't really bring it back. I don't, I can't explain that very well, but I think when they leave the renal center, people just don't want to think about it. I think that's really what the deal is. I will tell you from the level of renal that doesn't involve drugs, estimating the dry weight is very difficult, but also extremely important. So, you know, we try to get the dry weights as low as we can. It, some of these patients have no edema and their dry weights are off. I mean, there's not a lot of swan gang catheters going on in this country. It's not simple to get the um, intravascular volume accurately. We do try to follow weights, then your scales have to be accurate. We try to get the history of the patient. And then if the person's blood pressure is not controlled, we try to incrementally go down um, with each treatment. Um, but there's no doubt about it. If they did more dialysis than three days a week, which is pretty artificial when a kidney should work 24 seven, probably more dialysis would help with their blood pressure. <laughs> um, it's a little complex, but the dry weight is very difficult and it does matter because these patients, um, when we get it wrong and we take off more and they feel so cramping and, and, and not well and low blood pressure post dialysis, it's very, it's pretty disheartening. And you kind of feel like we missed the boat on that one, but it's very difficult to get it accurate also. Um, this is kind of important about the dialysis, the dialysability of di drugs and dialysis. I said that poorly, I apologize. Um, but the thing that's important is the following. Like the ARBs really don't, aren't removed with dialysis. So Losartans and Omasartans and Benicars and Darbys, they don't tend to get out. Um, the mineral quarter records, the aldactone, aldactones, the plerinones, if they can afford it, they're not really dialyzed out. But the, um, the ACEs are, the fosinopril isn't, and we don't, it's again, regional who's ordering what. We have some fosinopril in some of our patients, but it is not that common. The insurance companies have gotten involved and so most of the patients are, if they're on an ACE, is usually a lisinopril. And of those, 20 to 50% are dialyzed out from dialysis. So, um, you know, they would be advised to take their blood pressure, at, blood pressure meds at night if able or post dialysis, something like that. But there's some people on BID drugs and they'll try to hold it or they might have taken it and then, you know, it's dialyzed out. Um, a tenolol and metoprolol have a 50% di you know, removal. The calcium channel blockers aren't really removed and the alpha blockers aren't really removed. It's kind of important um, for, for us as nephrologists when we're telling people what to take. Um, the beta blockers, carbetalol is, well, both of them. Are. Carbetalol and metoprolol are used in this country pretty commonly. Um, both are important in the renal population and they are prescribed often. Um, there is some literature that says in the ESRD population, when you talk about which drugs to start with, there's actually some literature that would say it's probably important for um, the beta blockers maybe even to be first line or close to first line only because of the cardiac issues that and that's not when I wrote this slides in here, but this isn't like everybody doesn't feel that way. We definitely got to get the reduction in the dry weight. Um, restrict sodium if you could, but the beta blockers are pretty important in the ESRD population, I believe, to prevent cardiac events. A little bit of blood pressure, but cardiac events. Um, you know, the ACEs we use a lot in people with cardiomyopathy, and to be honest with you, most of our patients have cardiomyopathy. Um, so conclusion in the ESRD population, if they're able to use a home blood pressure cuff, that's great. If they're able to get, you know, an ambulatory blood pressure um, to diagnose it, we are not able to do that. We probably will be able to do that in the future, but we're not, able. but that would be more gold standard for all the nephrologists that are listening. Um, the dry weight and sodium is a big deal and that involves a lot of communication. There's some data that says, you know, beta blockers are first line primarily because it's cardiac events. We put on ACEs pretty often also, some calcium channel blockers. Norvas gets used a lot around here, Procardius sometimes. Um, and then be careful that we're not dialyzing the drug back off again. Um, Post-transplant, this is kind of, um, I'm not going to talk much about it, but it's a kind of big deal. 
Um, we're definitely trying to get more kidney transplants in this country. It's common that the patients are um, hypertension post transplant. And again, there's not a lot of randomized trials to tell you what's best practice, but there's a lot of variables that go into it, meaning the donor hyper was a donor hypertensive and you know the vascular disease and the age. And you don't always even know that information. Um, you know, the immunosuppressants alone, if they got prednisone, and again, a lot of the patients do get steroid post um, transplant, but they're trying to do prednisone less programs, but the CNIs definitely cause hypertension. Um, there's other, you know, urologic issues. There's outflow obstruction, the lymphocytes, the renal arsenosis can develop post. Certainly if they got infection, they're more at risk for, you know, the viral infections could get them some stenosis um, or graft dysfunction. Those poor patients, you know, um, they're rejecting, they get, um, you know, fever, hypertensive. Um, and then of course the, the, the recipient, I mean, our patients, we advocate transplants very strongly, but truth be told, there's very few of them that go to transplant that don't have some underlying hypertension or cardiac issue. The future, it's a tiny, tiny slide, but, but what's happening in the SGLT world is really interesting in the diabetic literature, the cardiac literature, um, and the renal literature. So right now, um, we don't give SGLTs under a GFR 30. Um, I did read something recently that I don't know, it might change. I, I can't say for sure, but I certainly wouldn't do it now. Anybody that's got a GFR under 30, I would not be using an SGLT, but the SGLTs seem to help people, you know, with um, helping with the blood sugar control, helping with the weight, helping with, um, you know, the blood pressure control. And it might be, I don't know what's gonna happen. It might be as important as one of those other drugs in the future. Um, health literacy, you know, talking about this, communicating about it and the importance as much as it sounds basic on blood pressure, it does matter and affects most of our specialty lines in the, car in the primary care cardiac and renal and neurology world, vascular surgery. Um, again, this is the same slide as earlier, but the reason I put it in again is only because, you know, one size does not fit all. You have to make individualized decision. It's not a talk meant to be like, we should walk away saying you've got to do this, that, and the other thing. It's a more a matter of know your patient and, and try to have some idea what they can do, what goes on in their home, what their heart and kidney function are. Um, and, you know, and at, at the end of the day, all of us in the world will try to just, you know, make our, well, ev all of our patients healthier, but we very much appreciate everybody trying to care for the kidney patients. Um, I'm sorry, I talk a lot. Does anybody have any Thank questions? You. Thank you for your uh, very interesting uh, conference uh, in this uh, very important topic about CKD and hypertension. And uh, I think if the audience want to ask some questions, and our friend. Uh, Dowie. I know it's late. I, I'm sorry. I probably talked too long. I, anyway. No, no, I, no. no. It, it was very, very good. No problem. We have enough time. Um, we have anyway, enough time. We have enough yeah, time. Yeah, I appreciate it. But I am sorry what's going on in the world in the COVID. And I hope you guys all no stay problem. safe. No problem. It's really, yeah. I, but I appreciate you having me. Okay. Yeah, it matters. It's, uh, Anyway, some days some of this conversation doesn't matter much when you've got really sick patients in front of you, but in but in the outpatient world it does. Anyway. anyway well, Father, if I may, Dr. Thank Dawi, you very Dr. Dawi. Yeah, if I ask questions, I have one question here. So uh, Amy, thank you very much for the presentation. The oh, word, sure. I was uh, struck by I was expecting you to to give us guideline, but I was struck by the fact that you are challenging us. And we, there is without, and you left the door open to uh, to how we manage the kidney patient. You didn't you didn't give us uh, like a recommendation to do this exactly because because one of the slides that you presented, and I was uh, kind of also struck by the fact that 50 percent or 40 50 percent of the of the uh, of uh, chronic kidney disease patient and stage one disease patient are excluded from the major. Cardiovascular yeah, that trial. that is an that is an yeah. old yeah no that's that was yes, a 2006 that, thing but yeah. it becomes yeah yes. so this is where I think it's very hard yeah um, you know there's going to be more trials the kidneys are getting the kidney patients yeah. are getting absolutely you know getting more invited to the trials but they were ex excluded because they're sick I think you know yeah. what I mean like they weren't really anyway so but that was a 2006 Rashid there yeah. um you know. 
it's just tough when you're not actually getting to get in it, you know, and then yeah. these are, these are not new. These are old. I mean, this is, oh, yeah. you know, 1994, the, the, you know, the heavy renal ones. So, I mean, the guy, you know, so I, if I didn't give you good guidelines, I apologize for that. But in general, the answer is, you know, less than 130. It's kind of like on this slide, um, you know, no, less than 130 over 80 protein, you approach differently than non-protein, but truth be told, what we want to do is try to get the patients to goal. I mean, this one has, you know, different guidelines, but it's, it's, you know, they were, they were squabbling over whether it's 120 or 130 or 140, but in general, I tell most people it's 120 to 130 is how I would approach it. And if you have protein, you try to reduce it. But um, as you know, it, the cost to these drugs is like difficult, you know, and the, um, yeah. I mean, the idea that I want to convey that uh, this patient was very complex and uh, yeah. there were not too many trials and, no, and, and we really, we don't know beside the 130 over 80, it's very complex to know what to do with this patient, what to use. And you left the door open to yeah. more thinking, more steady to be done to get- Oh, the I hope so. But the CRIC yeah, trial is interesting. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just difficult. I don't know. I've never, yeah. I, I don't know. I think it probably costs a lot of money and a lot of organization. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming spring, that the, yeah. the pandemic probably has sidelined most of this also, but. And Amy, the spring trial was done very well, tried, very good trial, but 50% of the, of the chronic kidney disease patients, they were not able to achieve the goal of, mm -hmm. of the optimal goal of hypertension. So that yeah, tells you about the complexity that you presented. To yeah, but I think, I think if we could get everybody to have home blood pressures, we would have a better idea about the reality. But that, even though I talk like this all the time, even though we say it, it, it doesn't like it's very hard for everybody to get their own blood pressure cuff and then get the data back to you and follow all the rules about how to check it. No, but thank you. Very, very yeah. challenging. Okay. Very, may, you make us think more about how we, what the goal of this patient and the very interesting because they have different, right. different things. Yeah. Well, well thank you, you very much for your attention. Excuse me, you have a question in the chat. If you can see the chat, I, I, don't, I don't know if you can see the chat. Do, do I can't see, see anything. I'll be perfectly what honest. What about uh, Dr. Saidan? Ask you a question. What about salt sens sensibility and resistance to choose therapeutic strategy? What do you think? And resistance to choose it? Yeah, and resistance to choose therapeutic strategy. You mean doctors or patients? What about salt sens sensibility? Can you uh, can you ask your question, Dr. Masoud Saidani? If you want to, to give us more precisions about your question, Dr. Saidani Masoud. Yes, uh, excuse my English. It's uh, for sensibility, uh, salt sensibility in the patients. Do you, uh, do you have to, uh, to make tests uh, before choosing uh, strategy to take uh, test for salt sensibility or resistance? Oh, so salt sensitive. So I, I would not say yes, meaning there is a lot of, I mean, this is off the cuff. This is just my experience. I am not really going to, I'm going to tell you what I know. Over the years, forever, they've always had this conversation of like salt sensitive rats or not salt sensitive rats, things like that. But at the end of the day, um, it's a very rare person that's with chronic kidney disease that isn't sensitive to salt. So in the population that we would see cardiac renal, eh, I don't do testing to say, oh, they, are they sensitive to salt? I more put it into just basic, just like you would tell people don't eat a lot of NSAIDs or something, you know, to protect their kidneys or, you know, mm -hmm. not try to get a lot of IV dye if you could help it, stuff like that. We do do a lot of education on trying to restrict sodium, it would be a very rare person that isn't, doesn't have underlying chronic kidney disease that isn't sensitive to salt. So I don't do any formal testing and I appreciate the question tremendously. I will tell you that when I was reading stuff, I thought, well, maybe I should start, like in the hospital, we do a lot of urine sodiums um, because we get called for acute kidney injury and stuff like that. And so, you know, you might calculate stuff and you want to know or about a renal and things like that. But but in general, in the office, I don't, I don't tend to order a ton of urine sodiums, but I did think after, after this, I might start trending them 
as far as when you're giving education on people for education on um, salt restriction, but in general, I don't go doing any formal testing about whether you're a salt sensitive person or not, but we definitely um, advocate trying not to eat a heavy high salt diet. And the thing that also happens with that, even if I was wrong that they weren't a salt sensitive person, um, is that they tend to start purchasing food that's more um, non-processed. So they tend to become more well just by the very nature of, you know, maybe planting their own garden or purchasing from the produce aisle with, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables because they want to follow low salt. And so by the very nature of doing that, they also tend to lose, you know, get healthier, maybe lose more weight. So it seems to be a good conversation at two fronts. I don't know if I answered your question well enough. I apologize. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Great, great presentation. Uh, New right. question. Uh, another question, please. What uh, about uh, sequential therapy in uh, diuretics? Uh, if we have resistance to one diuretics, uh, we try to change diuretics to uh, make uh, to uh, uh, to make. Uh, Effect? Uh, do we uh, can do we uh, do you uh, change uh, type of diuretics to to have uh, more effect? Um, I mean, about the would... cell therapeutic of diuretic. Yeah. yeah. So I think the question is, if you're having resistance to a diuretic, is there mm -hmm. a role for changing them, or how do you approach that? Yeah. Kind of? yes. yeah. Okay. So. I mean, yes, we do. So we would, it depends, again, we're construct, you know, we're a little bit tied by the insurance company. So um, it would be common that we would write for torsamide in the office if we needed a loop diuretic, like if your GFR was 25 or less. And we might, if they've already on Lasix, just keep using Lasix, meaning if they're taking one dose, we might double it, you know, take it in, you know, in the afternoon, try not to take it at 10 o'clock at night, that kind of thing. But really we would be trying to convert over to torsamide if able. And then if the person's able to monitor weight and not having any efficacy, we would often um, try to add on metolazone if they were, for example, in cardiac failure, you know, not so much um, just blood pressure, but if they were in congestive heart failure. So I apologize, I don't know if you're asking from the level of heart failure or not, but we do tend to try to use a combination of metolazone and a loop diuretic, um, but we have to, you gotta know what you're doing in the sense that you absolutely could precipitate significant hyponatremia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and it's, you know, they, they would need to have accessibility to have labs done um, pretty commonly, you know, um, but that does work as you well, you know, you well know if you're trying to treat heart failure. Um, but as far as like, if you've got a nephrotic syndrome patient, um, we would give them loop diuretic. We would probably give them torsamide. We would double the, the dose, but um, you got to watch the renal function and the potassium. And so we're not trying to, you know, we would definitely watch that we're not causing acute kidney injury. Um, mm -hmm. As far as Bumax, some of the, some docs really do like Bumax. Um, as far as the chlorothaladone, I think the chlorothaladone is a really good idea. That the, as far as hydrochlorothiazide, that it's so common, um, people use it, but there's no doubt about it. I think chlorothaladone is probably better. But I will tell you the biggest thing we're running into lately with all the thiazides is that we get called for hyponatremia in the hospital very commonly, like way more commonly than we used to. Um, you know, we could call for AKI, but we get the hyponatremia post hydrochlorothiazide is just so common, just common. And so then you become having to, you know, they've got a four or five day hospitalization to try to get back out of that. Um, yeah, so yeah, I would, I would um, double the dose on the loop if you're talking about a nephrotic person, if you're talking about a cardiac failure or CHF person, it's common that we try to put in metolazone as an add-on and teach them how to take that 30 minutes before. But you'd have to have, you'd have to have someone that lives close to a center to be able to get labs responsibly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is another question from the audience from Samia Zituni. She said, 
uh, at what level can we increase the dose of diuretic of loop in patient with limited diuresis? Can you, can you ask your question directly, Dr. Samia Zituni, if you want to ask your question to our guest? Hi. Go on, go on. Ask, ask your question. Dr. Samia Zituni, do you want to ask your question or not? Rashid, do you know the, understand the question? So, I mean, at what if uh, at what uh, level you can you will keep using diuretic the, for patient who is not responding to diuretic? Is uh, oliguric or anuric? And uh, what do you do next? Do you increase the dose or you do another? What is the maximum of the dose? Maybe. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I re I did read the data exactly. It's in the literature too. But I would say that we don't, you know we wouldn't use much more than like 80 BID of torsamide orally. I mean, that would be a lot or, you know, 160 BID of Lasix. Um, you know, you worry about ototoxicity a little bit and the fact that they're not responding. In the hospital, sometimes they use Lasix strips, but really, um, and we're comfortable with Lasix strips, but you don't get a whole lot more efficacy than if you did like, you know, IV BID dosing. Um, you do have to worry about ototoxicity and stuff, but really what happens is when you got, when you have a kidney patient or a cardiac renal patient who it becomes non-responsive to diuretics, that's when we get called to do, you know, ultrafiltration or dialysis because, you know, breathing is, you know, breathing trumps all these, you know, labs and, res you know, responses. So, um, that the person who's totally non-responsive to diuretics um, as an outpatient, if you had an outpatient and you were up to, you know, 80 BID of torsamide, or again, what I said about, you know, Lasix, they might have to be in the hospital, you know, so um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, this is why we're glad dialysis was invented, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, th okay. I think it's time to, yeah. to, to finish this very interesting session. And uh, I hope we will meet you again in the next future. Well, thanks for listening. Have and, a great afternoon. And, uh, Thank you. The, the last, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Shiban, maybe Shiban. Can you, or Rashid Dawi, if you want to, to give us a, a very quick home message, take home message, very quick. Before we close, I will, uh, I will just, uh, 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 on behalf of the, all the attending, I would like to thank Dr. Amy Hogan Morton for the excellent uh, talk about hypertension and chronic kidney disease and being able to challenge us, even myself, all the slides that she presented make me think about different things. And uh, it, was, uh, it was great talk. And we hope that one day we, we can uh, invite you to visit our, our beautiful country, Algeria. And oh, that'd be nice. Thanks. Yes. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you to everybody.